Welcome back to everyone. We've had a bit of an extended hiatus from the seminar series, so I hope everyone had a nice break. And uh, welcome especially to all the visitors from the Africa Department. We're happy today to have um, a bit of an in interdepartmental exchange we have today from the Africa Department, uh, Dr. Kwajo Osanyami Jr. Um, so in the African Department, he teaches, for those of you who don't know him, he teaches African Literature, Languages, Culture and Diaspora Studies here at SOAS. Um, and in particular, his teaching and research areas include African Literature, African American Literature, Afro-Caribbean Literary and Cultural Discourses, Narratives and mem Memorializations of the African Diaspora Experience in Literature, Film and Music, African, and di uh, African Diaspora Oral Literatures, Nationalism and Pan-Africanism in Literature, Modernity and Gender in Literary Cultural Studies, and additionally he's interested in using teaching and in particular literature, music and film as a transformative practice in the classroom and in the wider community within a broad context of African historical self-rehabilitation. And uh, he's here today to talk to us about um, African literatures um, and African linguistics, proverbial, poetic and philosophical language as the ideological interface of a new historic paradigm. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel, and um, thanks very much to the Linguistic Department for um, hosting me and allowing me to present uh, my paper here, and thank you all for being here to listen to. Um, I guess you've already seen the abstract that was circulated, but just before I start, I just want to add that what I'm trying to do in this paper and in this research, which is kind of part of a bigger project, is to draw our attention to the fact that when we read our literatures and our cultures in translation, especially in English for example, because the writers who have produced these works inevitably are connected to Africa, all come from Africa somehow, there's a kind of subterranean language which is not always very visible in the translations as we read them and that sometimes you need some kind of extra knowledge in terms of a little bit of knowledge in terms of the linguistics, the language and the structure and you know the proverbial cultural, philosophical context to arrive at a better understanding. So the interface between literature and linguistics that I'm talking about here is simply to kind of affirm um, a deeper notion of looking closely at language and what it means so that when you're reading and you're interpreting according to the themes of the novel or whatever, you, you know that you haven't got it all as it is, but that there could be some more layer, layers to it. Okay. So um, I'll start at this point, and I'm going to speak for about an hour roughly. I'll make sure I speak for, I don't speak for more than an hour, and then we'll have at least about half an hour for questions, which is what Rachel and I agreed. While the field of African linguistics is a broad, all-encompassing subject area that theoretically may be said to refer to any academic subject matter that deals with the detailed study of African languages in terms of their structure and meaning, there's an easily identifiable substrate substructum of this intellectual arena that has to do specifically with the ways and means by which the language of African literature and in particular of African creative fiction dwells on the culturally significant or specific meanings that form an important part of contemporary African narratives. In this type of writing, artists self-consciously formulate linguistic patterns and thought systems that they project and translate into their work. Consequently, for example, one occasionally encounters a glossary of words in African fiction with translations from one African language or the other into English or some other European language as a form of explanation for the uninitiated reader. And you see this sometimes when you see books of African fiction. Aside this, a host of African writers have attempted to address the question of the connection between their consciously formulated and ideologically laden thought patterns in their extra fictional works and interviews and through all kinds of statements and pronouncements. Kenyan novelist and prolific essayist Ngugi Wa Thiongo, for example, famous for his countless disquisitions on the role of language in identity formation and the role of European cultural imperialism in African self-subjugation and alienation, makes the following poignant observation in his essay titled Imperialism of Language, English as a Language for the World, with a question mark. And he says, every language has two aspects. One aspect is its role as an agent that enables us to communicate with another in our struggle to find the means of survival. The other is, the, is its role as a carrier of the history and culture built into the process of that communication over time. I'm interested here specifically in teasing out the full ideological significance of Ngugi's view that language acts as a carrier of the history and culture built into our communicative processes. 
Focusing on this is important because there seems to me to be a glaring lack of detailed attention to the uses and significance of African and African inflected languages. Whether dealing with the original African mother tongues as represented in the numerous literatures from the continent and their translation and transliteration into English or any other of the major globally dominant European languages or whether examining the different form reformulated uses of even originally European languages by writers of African descent. Let me briefly point out that by African inflected languages, I refer, for example, to an English which is spoken with an African flavor, precisely of the sort that led Chino Achebe to state, for example, at the conclusion of his essay, The African Writer and the English Language, that, and I'm quoting Achebe, I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience but I will ha it will have to be a new English, still in full communion with its ancestral home, but altered to suit its new African surroundings. What I refer to as self-consciously formulated linguistic patterns and thought systems operates within the literature in a myriad of ways. In some instances, the African or African descent writer, having more facility with the European language of his Western education, might deal, for example, with the deleterious effects of colonial education at the same time as that kind of education is presented to us, even to this day, as the only means for attaining personal and even communal development in our increasingly globalized world. Thus, for example, in Zimbabwean Titi Dangaramba's nervous conditions, linguistic aphasia in relation to Shona is presented in a number of interesting ways. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote about three passages from the novel and then explicate. Okay, so this character, Inhamu, is um, a member of a family in which boys are privileged over girls in terms of education um, in, in Shona society, and he, he's about to get the opportunity to go to school. Inhamu began school in the year that he turned seven. That, this was the age at which the government had declared that African children were sufficiently developed cognitively to be able to understand the abstractions of numbers and letters. One plus one equals two. K-I-T-S-I -I equals Kitsi. Nehamo was one of the youngest pupils in his class. Perhaps other parents, believing that we really were a retarded lot, thought it best to let their children's abilities mature a little before exposing them to the rigors of formal education. And then another passage, which I will explicate later. Then when Inhamu, so Inhamu has now been to school, he started the process of school and he returns to the homestead. And when you move from school, you go to the urban area, the city, you know, from the village or the homestead. But he comes home on a vacation. Then when Inhamu came home at the end of the first year with Baba Mukuru, you could see he too was no longer the same person. The change in his appearance was dramatic. He had added several inches to his height and many to his width, so that he was not little and scrawny anymore, but fit and muscular. Vitamins had nourished his skin to a shiny smoothness, several tones lighter in complexion than it used to be. His hair was no longer arranged in rows of dusty wild cucumber tufts, but was black, shiny with oil, and smoothly combed. All this was good, but there was one terrible change. He had forgotten to speak Shona. A few words escaped haltingly, ungrammatically, and strangely assented when he spoke to my mother, but he did not speak to her very often anymore. So there's a process of alienation going on. He talked most fluently with my father. They had long conversations in English, which Inhamu broke into small, irregular syllables, and which my father chopped into smaller and even rougher phonemes. Father was pleased with Inhamu's command of the English language. He said it was the first step in the family's emancipation, since we all could improve our language by practicing on Inhamu. But he was the only one who was impressed by this inexplicable state my brother had developed. The rest of us spoke to Nhamo in Shona, to which, when he did answer, he answered in English, making a point of speaking slowly, deliberately, enunciating each syllable clearly so that we could understand. This restricted our communication to mundane, insignificant themes. Then the last one that I want to quote in, in relation to this particular novel before I, I kind of begin to break it down is um, Inhamo has a sister called Niasha, and they have cousins. They has a sister called Tambuja, and they have they have cousins called Niasha and Chido who get to go educated in England for a while, and then they come back. And before they go to England, they can speak Shona fluently. You know, they're Africans, they're Shonans, they're Zimbabwean. But they come back, and there's a kind of family meeting, and there's a dance going on, and Tambuja is trying to invite his cousins who've been to England to study to come and join the dance. And what happens here is interesting. We are dancing, I invited Niasha, who took a long time to understand. 
They don't understand Shona very well anymore, her mother explained. They have been speaking nothing but English for so long that most of their Shona has gone. What my guru said was bewildering and offending. I had not expected my cousins to have changed, certainly not so radically, simply because they had been away for a while. Besides, Shona was our language. What did people mean when they forgot it? Standing there, trying to digest these thoughts, I remembered speaking to my cousins freely and fluently before they went away, eating wild fruits with them, making clay pots and swimming in Nyamarira. Now they had turned into strangers. I stopped being offended and was sad instead. Ask them, my guru, I urged. Even if they don't understand, they wouldn't refuse, would they? Things like that, I continued vaguely but earnestly, would bring their speech back more quickly. She talked to her mother, Nyasha talked to her mother eagerly in an English whose accent was so strange I could not understand a word of it, co-opting Chido into the, the discussion and talking in very definite tones. I was sure that my cousins wanted to join the merrymaking, but my guru was not encouraging. I could tell from her voice, which was flat and passive, and from the odd word that I picked up, like dirty and sleep. It was odd that my guru preferred her children not to dance. If they could not enjoy themselves with us, there was no reason for them to have come home. I think Nyasha was saying similar things to my guru because in the end her irritation became so open that my aunts stepped, stopped their lively conversations to find out what was going on. Now what's the problem, my guru? Asked the titted Gladys. You are not forbidding your children to join the others, are you? Why should I do that, Tete? My guru repri replied evenly. I'm only saying they should rest. You know, a flight is very tiring. But if you say they should dance, they shall. Tete has told you to go to the dance, she informed the children in her uninflected voice. Chido decli declined politely, one of the children. It's all right, mom, I'm a bit tired anyway. Niasha clicked the tongue scornfully, her tongue scornfully and switched herself off. It was very abrupt the way she did it. Okay, now the breakdown. What is significant here in the passages that I've just read, and especially in this very last one, is that the alienation of Tambu Jai's cousins from her is simply as a result of their immersion in the newly acquired language of English and the acquisition of a new culture. A culture which also comes with what Tambu Jai co considers a domineering attitude. The cousins' refusal to participate in the family dance, aided by their disapproving mother, it's a key strategy in the dominant colonial metropolitan English language and its culture subversion of African communal self-identification. This representation of African cultural alienation takes the form of a self-conscious representation in the narrative, in the passages that I just read, of the adverse effects of the newly acquired culture. It is an affirmation of the superior sense of knowledge of the way things are in a rapidly changing world. My guru intimates a better and higher knowledge of the way of the world of the newly acquired culture in a recourse to a kind of language that appears as normal kind of discourse, even conversational. Casually, she informs us, I'm only saying they should rest, you know, a flight is a very tiring thing, but if you say they should dance. However, these statements by Maguru articulate a psychological erasure of self certitude in the African that is also explicitly coded as both dominant and as, as more progressive than the language and the culture associated with Shona. In being gradually separated from the Shona family dance, Nyasha and Chido, children who will ultimately grow into adults, are also being primed for looking down on African cultural practices and norms. This explains the bizarre attitude of Nghamo, cited earlier, when he comes back home and suddenly he cannot speak Shona. Nervous conditions is just an example of a narrative that foregrounds the different modes of socialization that are a direct result of the diverse linguistic heritages and backgrounds of the characters. The British English of, the, of, of Nyasha, Chido and my guru, the more African English of Tambujai, the Shona of Tambujai's alienated mother Ma Shingai, who sees the loss of language by the Western, her Western educated acculturated children as a crisis of identity. And I'm quoting their mother, who, who does not speak English, who is not Western educated, and then this is what she says in the novel. It's the Englishness, she said. It will kill them all if they aren't careful. And she snorted, look at them. That boy Chido can hardly speak a word of his own mother tongue. And you'll see, his children will be worse. His children will disgrace us. This affirmation of a crisis of identity is not exaggerated. Ma Shingai, Tambujai's mother, like Esikom, the alienated mother of Amatedu's 
play the dilemma of a ghost, which we shall encounter a little later, is an uneducated African woman. Uneducated, that is by the standards of Western education. And the point that I'm making here is that we talk about being uneducated because you're not Western educated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in other terms and according to other concepts, you are not educated. So I'm specifying the Westernness of the education. Okay. Nyasha, Chido, my guru, the patriarch of the family Baba Mukuru, are all Western educated, having spent time in England. What should not be lost on us as readers and critics is that by calling to, into question the mode of English acculturation of the others, the text also establishes through Manshingai, through Manshingai, a self consciously critical voice and language, and a resistant African character who defines herself very much in position to the colonial culture and the dominant culture. However, there's also a problem of sorts in this representation. Because to arrive at what I've described as a critical and ethical approach that articulates and sustains a more coherent sense of self-understanding, which I, it's in my abstract, especially in relation to the historic situation of Africans today, we must remember that the African writer has also been largely constrained, as in this case, by historical circumstances to somewhat inadequately capture and hence partially misrepresent the separation of cultural and ideological spheres of the African and the Western by presenting a somewhat unisonant but problematic narrative written in an European language. This point requires some careful elaboration. As readers of Nervous Conditions, the novel from which I've just read, for example, we presume that the protagonists we encounter are speaking the same language and in a sense operating within the same cultural ideological realm. But Mashingai, identified as deeply rooted and aligned to the homestead, to the Shona homestead, that clearest of symbols of Chishona life, and I'm indebted to my senior brother uh, Shenjirai here for telling me that the language is actually Chishona and not Shona. The Mashingai, identified as deeply rooted and aligned to the homestead in that clearest of symbols of Chishona life, is in real life uneducated in Western terms. Thus, while the novel and the passage that I have just read represents her and all the other characters are speaking English, she's in real life terms meant to be speaking Shona, or more appropriately, Chishona, as for instance in the passage just cited, when she talks about the Englishness killing them, in which she castigates the Englishness of the other characters and the loss of their mother tongue. The point, my point, what am I trying to say? In such fictionalized historical narratives as Nervous Conditions and several other works, there are dimensions of language and culture that are either overlooked or underrepresented in which emanates from a character like Mashingai. Consequently, emotions expressed through language, significant verbal gestures, exclamations of disgust, inflections of tone and anger, and bewilderment, etc., etc., the list goes on and on ad infinitum, are significantly conspicuous by their absence from the transliterated English version of the Shona that she speaks. So what I'm saying is that we've been able to surmise a bit of the critique of the English colonial culture through her saying is the Englishness is the Englishness, and it has been presented to us in the English language. But what I'm saying is that in reality, the woman is actually speaking Chishona. And were we to hear her speak in Chishona, and were we to be sitting here and to comprehend Chishona, the ideological valence and the repercussions of what exactly she's saying will be more powerful because it will involve a lot more other things in terms of her dissatisfaction with the Englishness and what it's doing to her children. Okay, it bears noting here that it is virtually impossible to disconnect a literature from the culture and the language that define it. Thus, while the Chishona may have been translated and translated into English by the Zimbabwean author, the Chishona spoken by Tambujai's mother, Mashingai, as represented in the novel, loses some of its vibrant, dynamic, and ultimately essential attributes. Attributes that cannot cross the linguistic and cultural barriers that writing in English presents for the Shona writer speaking in English. Whereas these thoughts and emotions expressed in the same mother tongue of Chishona that Mashingai Lambas Chido for not knowing are deeply central to our analysis of the present day historical situation of the alienation of the African, she is herself presented as speaking English. This is an, anom an anomaly that reminds one here of the poem Migrations by Abnabuzia, where she observes how Africans communicate. This is an extract from this poem. In the half-life, half-light of alien tongues, in the uncanny fluency of the other's language, we relive the past in rituals of revival, unraveling memories in slow time, gathering the present. Buzia's reference to the uncanny fluency of the other's language, the half-life, half-light of alien tongues, suggests that despite the most consummate ability we may have to think in the other's language, in English, in French, in German, in Spanish, in Portuguese, and so on and so forth, such reflections also trigger incomplete thought processes. And perhaps Barbadian writer 
Kamal Brathwaite puts it most appositely when he asserts in his essay, English in the Caribbean, that the imperial English education made the people of the Caribbean more familiar with Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood than it did with Sister Queen Nani of the Maroons. What I'm suggesting, therefore, is that our real appreciation of the real, real historic situation of the African is potentially profoundly misshaped, given that our understanding of the presentation of culture of our history is incomplete. So as much as we examine our literatures, questions relating to the enforced amnesia of Africans of their languages and the multiple disenabling cultural consequences of this syndrome are still to be properly addressed. I want to add further that this fact is so highly linked with the present so-called underdevelopment, poor, the other development, this, is, this fact is so highly linked with the present so-called underdevelopment, poor and third world state of Africa to make reference to, but not to affirm. I'm just using terms that I use, but I'm not affirming them. The patronizing words that are often used to describe the continent. The link between this linguistic malaise and our development has been grossly underplayed. The loss of language is also, in effect, the loss of de developmental potential. Whatever development takes place in our world today is tilted in favor of those with a Western education. And I'm suggesting that is why in Africa, people complain about poverty, about whatever, whatever. But the elites and the acculturated who have the Western education and the English and the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the da 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 are cool. They ain't got no problem. You understand? Okay, but let me move on. Ama Taidu, a Ghanaian. Okay, so let me cite an illustration of that. Let me just cite one, one thing. This is an interview with Ama Taidu, and the interviewer is Adiola, Adiola James, a Nigerian. And Adiola says, well, it is definitely a very important issue. It's connected to the point I just made. I have just come from Dar es Salaam, where I interviewed Penny Namuhando, who has written eighth place in Kiswahili. Yet hardly anyone outside Tanzania knows about her. She herself says that she has never been invited to any African writers' conference, so that she feels isolated. Yet this is a person who is writing in, to, for her public and is very highly thought of in Tanzania. I'm sure that other Africans would also like to share whatever she has to say because it has relevance for all of us. Isn't this difficulty of, okay. So then Amar Taidu, a, a Ghanaian playwright, novelist, and short story writer has observed, and I'm quoting Amar Taidu here, and, and then again this, this quotation is in relation to the points that I've made pre previously. I've reflected over on it, I don't know how often. I think that the whole question of the writer's relationship to her society has to do with language. I don't know whether you thought of it that way when you were asking the question, but here we are, writing in a language that is not even accessible to our people, and one does not worry about that, you know? For instance, writing in English makes it possible for me or any African writer to communicate with other people throughout the continent who share that colonial language. On the other hand, our relationship to, on the other hand, one's relationship to one's own immediate environment is fairly non-existent or rather controversial. These are some of the ideas that I've come up with. Okay, so Amar Taidu's play, the author that I just read, her play, The Dialogue of a Ghost, will help illuminate another dimension of my argument further. This play, The Dialogue of a Ghost, is a story about a Ghanaian, Atto Yosin, who travels to the US to study and meets and marries an Afri African-American woman and brings her home. The couple face all kinds of difficulties and problems, not only because of, of cultural differences, but also because Atto suffers psychologically from having lived in America. His newly acquired American ways have become strained to his folk when he returns home. And his mother, Isikom, a woman unfamiliar with Western ways, and in this sense, Isikom is very much like the woman that we talked about before, uh, the, uneg the uneducated by Western standards, Mashingai. Isikom, a woman unfamiliar with Western ways because she has not experienced Western education, and who, in her own words, and I'm quoting for her from the novel, did not hear the school bell when it rang. She ends up being distressed by the thoroughly transformed and almost unrec unrecognizable character of a son. And think for a moment of Unhamo's transformation when he goes to the, you know, to the school to learn English and comes back to the Shona homestead. And think of Atto when he comes home having studied in America. So there's something in there in terms of self-Eurasia, language, culture, identity, etc., etc. While admittedly Atto's people have their own stereotypes of Yuleli, the, ens the formerly en en and formerly enslaved Africans. His African-American wife, Yuleli Rush, is, a very, is very disrespectful of Ghanaian culture and of her husband, Atu's relatives, something illustrated in the following extract from the play. And I'm going to read briefly again from the play. And I'm starting with the, um, the play's stage directions. Two hours later, Esikom, that is the mother of this woman, this guy who's traveled abroad, enters from the door on the right, carrying two bundles wrapped in sackcloth. She opens the door to Atto's apartment. She puts the bundles in, her, in, in the outer room, comes 
out and is closing the door when Atu and Yuleli enter the courtyard from the path. So Yuleli says, she sees the woman, she sees Atu's mother. I say, she, gla she glares at Isikom for a second or two and then turns on Atu. Atu, would you care to ask your mother what she wants in our room? And of course, something is happening here because Atu is in an African cultural context where there's more proximity between, your mother can enter your room at any time because you know you, there's that kind of close connection and this African-American woman is thinking, you know, a sense of privacy and individualism, etc., etc. So something interesting is going to happen here. Atu, uh, uh, she, he hesitates talking to his mother. His wife is saying, could you ask your mother? But under normal circumstances, Atu wouldn't even dare ask the mother why you're in my room, right? So Atu, uh, mommy, were you looking for us? And then Atu's mother, hmm, they told us when we arrived from the farm that you and your wife have come to spend today and tomorrow with us. So I thought I would bring you one or two things, for I hear food is almost unbuyable in the city these days. And your nephews are so naughty that I knew if I did not bring them here, they would steal the snails and roast them all in an hour's time. So Atu's mother has brought this, her son and his wife snails, which is a delicacy within fancy culture. And Ileli, what she's saying, and notice that when you really ask Atu what she's saying, at this point, we realize that Atu's mother is actually speaking Fanti. But here we have, we're having the translation in English. And so again, again, this is part of the problem that I enunciated earlier with Mashingai speaking Shona, but we've been told speaking English. Then Atu says, oh, she only brought us food to take back with us. Then Yuleli says, what kind of food? Then Atu says, mommy, what did you bring? Then Atu's mother, Isi says, can your wife herself go, go and see? After all, these are all women's affairs. Or do not our masters, the scholars, know what goes on in their wife's kitchen? Then Atu says persuasively to her, to Yuleli, darling, will you go and check her, please? Yuleli walks rather puzzled into the room. As she enters, she exclaims, sweet Jesus, and rushes out, closing the door behind her. So Atu asks, darling, what is it? And then Atu says, mommy, my wife says she thanks you. No, then Atu says, darling, what is it? Then Yuleli, um, some crawling things. Composing herself. Anyway, tell your mother we are grateful. Then Atu says, Mommy, my wife says she thanks you a lot for the things. Then AC, Atu's mother says, Tell her I'm glad she likes them. Now I think I will go and prepare the evening meal. Monka will cook for you and your wife, your wife some rice and stew. If you need anything, you come and tell us or just shout for any of the children. Then she says to Yuleli, My lady, I'm saying goodbye. Accompanied by a wave of her hand, Yuleli waves back. The, 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 the moment she's through the door on the right hand side, Yuleli rushes in to close it. Then she rushes into the room and brings out the sack bundle. She's crossing towards the path when Atu, Atu stops her. So she's gone and taking the thing that she's, that's frightened her, that she screamed about, and she's, going to, she's making a move to take it out or something, but she's pretending she likes it, right? Then Atu says, what's all this? Then Yuleli says, those horrid creatures, of course. Then Atu says, why are you taking them? Then Yuleli says, throwing them away, of course. Then Atu says, what rubbish? Then Yuleli says, what do you mean, what rubbish? If you think I'm going to sleep with those creatures, then you are kidding yourself. Then Atu says, but you can't throw them away just like that. Haven't you seen snails before? Then Yuleli says, my dear, did you see a single snail crawling on the streets of New York? All the time you were in the States? <laughs> and anyway, seeing snails and eating them are entirely different things. So then Atu goes on, but I would, give, I would give them to my mother to give them to me. I, would, I, would, I, would, I could give them to my mother to cook them for me. Then Yuleli says, and give them the opportunity to accuse me of unadaptability. No, thank you. She wrenches the bundle from Atu, and as she turns off, Monka opens the door on the right. Her eyes take in the scene. Yuleli hurries down and dumps the sack near the path. All the same time, Monka, at the same time, Monka disappears. So what is happening is something interesting because this guy has come back suddenly from his country, from America. Suddenly, he can't eat something that he was nurtured on. You know, so there's a kind of disalienation there. And I'm saying that there's a connection between this and that. And I'm saying that the novel is capturing it, but there are other issues to be explored. Okay, let me explicate a, a little bit more um, by getting back to my text here. Um, okay, disappointed by Atu's attitude of a loss of cultural consciousness, because you, you, Atu's mother eventually hears that the lady has thrown the snails away. AC convinces her frustration through proverbial language. And then she says, and I'm quoting for the book, before the stranger should dip his finger into the thick palm nut soup, it is a townsman must have told him. She's citing a proverb. Mm? What is also established here is that beyond merely being disappointed, however, Esikom's motherly fan. So Esikom is really very disappointed and Yuleli is disrespectful throughout the text, etc., etc. But what is also being established here is that be, be, 
Beyond being merely disappointed, AC Combs' motherly function and a caring character and disposition towards her son and his foreign Afri African American wife is also a temperament that is encapsulated in the Akan Fanti proverb. Right? Which whose near corresponding rendition? Notice how I choose my word though. My word though. Near corresponding rendition. It means that it's not quite, but okay. <laughs> whose near corresponding rendition in English would be would be um I beg your pardon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm kind of it's a proverb, it is okay, okay. It, okay, so or bad time name the baby dear. It's a proverb that is figured overtly in the play, even by AC Combs' other name, Mami, the fancy word Mami, whose near corresponding rendition in English would be the word mother. Mami has several other associative indications. Okay, so this, this, this proverb that I just quoted means it is a mother who knows what a child will eat. So I'm saying that wanting to give her the child snails, wanting to cook for them, asking her do actual sister, daughter to cook for them is a kind of motherly function, which, but in many readings of the play, because this AC Com embraces Eulalie in spite of all the rudeness and the disrespect and everything, and when, it, the, when the play is being interpreted, it is said, oh, this is a kind of romanticized, idealist um, reading of um, the mother Africa trope. How can this woman who's so disrespectful suddenly be reconciled with the mother? But I'm going to go a bit into that now. Okay, so, all right, the play presents AC Combs' identity as central to the self-constitution of the compassionate matriarch of the African family. This is indeed literally signified in the play by the extract just read, where AC Com, in conversation with our two states, oh, they told us when we arrived that, you know, um, you, you've come to stay with us and the food is very, unbi almost unbiable in the, in the city these days. As with Mashingai from Nervous Conditions, we note Eulalis from Eulalis' questions to Atu that AC Com is speaking funny. Thus, the full significance of what she says and which is really through her character and her speech in English is not conveyed. So I'm saying that we still missing something because were she to be speaking in front of you, the interpretation is different and there's more in there okay the historical mother africa rendered through isi Combs' maternal role is represented as embodying a full self-awareness of the wants of her needy children it is interesting that while isi com via her actions articulates an image of cultural harmony in spite of the eroding consciousness of her two Yuleli, on her part reinforces patronizing western assumptions of cultural superiority over africa and Africans with a question, my dear, did you see a single snail crawling in the streets of New York? So if snails are not eaten in New York, snails should not be eaten in Ghana, you know, that kind of thing. Here again, Edu is interested in exploring the contradictory identities that emerge in the shaping of Africans and people of African descent. That's a result of their different historical locations and different modes of acculturation. One is reminded in particular of Chino Achebe's statement that Africa is not a mere geographical expression, it is also a metaphysical landscape. It is in fact a view of the world and of the whole cosmos perceived from a particular position. Achebe's observation would suggest that one needs a certain grounding in Africa to appreciate and articulate this view and this perspective. Despite Yuleli having a very demeaning attitude towards Atu's people, at the end of the play, Esikom asserts, that's at the very end of the play, um, she says, Esikom says, and I'm reading, and we must be careful with your wife. You must you tell her, you tell us her mother is dead. If she has if she had any tenderness, her ghost must be keeping watch over her. All which happened to her. This posture of AC Combs has been understood to represent an idyllic, impractical, romanticized image of a mother Africa embracing her wayward child or children. Several critics have seen this as yet another uncritical evocation of the nostalgic and hence problematic mother Africa trope in African and African diaspora and fiction. Her, but to come to a proper appreciation of AC Combs' worldview and her actions, we have to relate this to other, you know, cultural narratives within um, the Fanti context. AC Combs' demeanor in relation to Yuleli is an outlook that can be interpreted philosophically via the Akan Fanti motherhood affirming proverb which says, Oba time empo oba boni. And, a near equivalent translation of which in English will be a mother does not reject or ignore a bad child. And I'm saying that that is the kind of cultural context from which this woman is coming, which is not appreciated because we need to decode and break down and translate the language. We need some other extra knowledge of the cultural context within the language that Fanti, which has been translated into the English, is. And were I to be in as intelligible in the Shona as um, Shenzhirai here, I could have shown exactly what the Shona 
you know, I could have drawn more on the Shona in that respect. Okay, with the attitude, AC Com also symbolizes one of the most overriding characteristics associated not only with the historically imagined idyllic mother Africa, but also with real life African mothers. Warmth, love, and protection. AC Com further becomes an Edu's text, emblematic of a non alienated figure of resistance who refuses, in spite of all the historical odds against her and her people, to succumb easily to the loss of yet another more of a progeny who has undertaken the journey of return to Africa as part of a psychological process of self rehabilitation and as a descendant of formerly enslaved Africans. And I'm saying that Yuleli, in spite of her dislocation within the culture, has actually come home to connect with the people. And the African mother, both in terms of the mother continent receiving this, the children, and also in terms of Atu's mother, actually appreciates this and is working along those lines. Okay. In what other specific ways then may, may a, the case for a closer philosophical intellectual link between the study of African linguistics and the general field of African literature be made? And what I'm saying is that to arrive at these kind of extra meanings in the text, which I haven't seen in any kind of you know reading in terms of whatever and, you know bringing in these other proverbial whatever things, we need to look at that close relationship between literature and philosophy, and that's the kind of connection that I'm trying to establish between you know linguistics. One of the fi first incongruities of our modern era is the still ongoing alignment of modernity and development, for example, with Western intellectual and philosophical thought and traditions. This is a recurring motif in our intellectual life, in our educational systems, with consequences for our real world existence. As one writer has put it, much of the philosophical education of Europeans and Americans consists of a systematic immersion in a dogma according to which the first signs of human reasoning appeared in Europe, usually among Greek ancestors. Such a doctrine collapses the moment it is confronted with real, accurate, factual, historical data. In this sense, even African philosophers assume the predominance of Western tradition, especially in relation to a tradition of literacy. Thus, one is not too surprised to hear Otherwise remarkable an African philosopher as the Ghanaian Kwame Jechi argue that, and I'm quoting him, as a result of the lack of writing in Africa's historical past, the indigenous philosophical output of African thinkers in the traditional setting has remained part of their oral traditions and has come to be expressed also in religious and sociopolitical beliefs and institutions. While the deconstructive work done by people like Jechi, because what they've done is basically say that, look, there's an African philosophy, and that philosophy can be retrieved, is recoverable from the oral narratives, etc. But I'm making a different point here, right? While the deconstructive work done by Jeche and other African philosophers cannot by any means be downplayed, it is also very disenabling for the project of African historical self-rehabilitation and reconstruction to adopt this thoroughly a historical approach. Fallacious statements such as Jeche's have been repeated so often that they have acquired the mantra and disposition of truth and have become a kind of truth, so much so that we now have continuously affirmed how the African oral traditions are there source of African intellectual and philosophical thought and of African creative writing. Do you get the point I'm making? That in, in order to counter that tradition, that thing that Africa is also has a civilization, it always has to be reference to the oral tradition. That is, of course, important. But we then, be, we then ignore totally the written tradition and assign all of that to the West. And I'm saying that that's also a problem. And the way to actually critique and decode that is also, again, this close attention to linguistics. OK. The fact, though, is that Okay, so, so have been repeated to become a kind of truth. Okay. So, to con so, so that we now have to continuously affirm how the African oral traditions are the source of African intellectual and philosophical thought and of African creative writing. The fact, though, is that writing was developed in Africa before 3,000 3, years before Christ. Some of the African scripts in use then were hier hieroglyphics, hieratic, demotic, Kushite, Coptic, Amharic, Sabian, Giz, Insibindi, Mende, Toma, Vai. Africa had empress, empresses and empires before Europe. African civilizations were built long before European civilizations. Some of the African civilizations predated European civilizations are Mizoram, Nile, Kushite, Malian, Azanian, Zimbabwean, Bugandan, Congolese, Ghanaian, and Benin. Africa has an old literature, a huge and sophisticated collection of texts. Some were inscribed into stone monuments and great public constructions. Some painted on the walls of pyramid chambers, burial tombs, and the lids of sarcophagi. Some were written in ink, usually of two colors, headings in red and body in text in black, on papyrus reeds, beaten, washed and pasted together, layer on layer, to make flat, smooth surfaces. And some were written on reusable tablets convenient for classroom exercises. This corpus of writing is multi-generic. This is the world's oldest literature. and. Talking about the genesis of literary genres and historical origin of literature, we have to look at that. So I'm saying that to talk about our literature and to have establish that continuum in terms of the way we break down and interpret our world, we have to look at the oral traditions, but also look at this old literature, which we usually as assume, you know, we don't have, we, we only have the oral tradition. Okay. It is important to point out though that Africans of antiquity never claim to be the only possessors of rationality. Neither is such a claim being made here. 
Mm -hmm. What then is the connection here with the study of African linguistics in tandem with African literature and even in reference to past African civilizations? We have perhaps to turn to Sheikh Antadio's poignant observation that no thought and particularly no philosophy can develop outside of its historical terrain. Our young philosophers must understand this and rapidly equip themselves the necessary intellectual means in order to reconnect with the home of philosophy in Africa instead of getting bogged down in the wrong battles of ethno-philosophy. Ethno-philosophy, Pauline Huntungi and others. I'm not really interested in them as such, but I mentioned them in passing. Whether Africa does have a written, you know, we, the, 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 whole, the whole point is beating about the bush. Even having an argument that is not there, slicing with thing here because it's wrong-footed. Mm? At the heart of this argument is one of the most pertinent issues we have to deal with in terms of establishing a new historic paradigm for reading our cultures, for interpreting our societies, and then subsequently for re-energizing the project of cultural awareness. Our spiritual, cultural reawakening, which we can pursue largely through a careful examination of our history, our literature, our culture, etc., is important. However, one of the biggest challenges and, and we need this as a prelude to the economic, political, and social development that we imagine and envisage. However, one of the biggest challenges that we face today is that huge numbers of the African populace are, margin are marginalized from accessing the very forms of African historical knowledge which are central to the awakening of their minds. And I'm saying that partly because of the problems of language and not only speaking only to a, specific, a, a particular elite, and then you want to talk about, you know, the same people who are in charge, the writers, the politicians, etc., don't really have that connection with the people because everything is done differently. Okay, in addition to that, we have the present day situation where recycled historical myths, often of African origin, but distorted through historical erasure and substitution, have led Africans to become psychologically and spiritually dependent on other peoples and gods and images that have created, that have been created for other people for their own strategic beneficial existence. And to arrive at this, it's really, it's a, it's, in fact, this is almost like a kind of central point within our consciousness because it relates to a whole tradition of our spiritual, spirituality and our religion, etc. How can we get Africans to? believe, for example, that the term Christ is not an Indo-European root. And again, this has to do with the work of linguistics, using the, language, the field of linguistics and psychoanalysis and anthropology, etc., to, to connect with literature. Because the information is from the literature, but the breakdown of the information is coming from a detailed analysis of the language. How can we get Africans, for example, to, to believe that the term Christ is not an Indo-European root? It comes from the pharaonic Egyptian expression, ke shesheta, which in quotes, means he who watches for the mysteries and was applied to the divinities, Osiris, Anubis, etc. It was applied to Jesus only in the fourth century by religious contamination. So, and then, in fact, then a few other statements in relation to this point that I'm making, because some of you, I mean, people here will be familiar with, with you know, the, 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 um, what I'm saying, when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I've made, when I've made the point, the argument will become clearer. When I, let, me, let me just read and then explain. Um, Ra, in the history of religious thought, the first god, Orthogenius, was not created, was, has neither father nor mother. Seth, jealous because he is sterile, kills his brother Osiris, who symbolizes vegetation from the discovery of agriculture to the Neolithic period. Osiris rises from the dead to save humanity from famine. Osiris is a god of redemption. In any case, Osiris is the god who, 3,000 years before Christ, dies and rises from the dead to save men. His humanity is god of redemption. He ascends to heaven to sit at the right hand of his father, the great god Ra. He is the son of God. In the book of the dead, it is said 1,500 years before Christ. This is the flesh of Osiris, Dionysius. Osiris' replica in the northern Mediterranean will save five years before Christ, drink, this is my blood, eat, this is my flesh. And one can see how the degradation of these types of beliefs can lead to the... Okay, so Egyptian cosmology also states, I was one, I became three. This notion of the Trinity permeates all Egyptian religious thought and is found again in the multiple divine triads such as Osiris, Isis, Horus, or Ra in the moon, morning at noon at night. Okay, so the, what is the, you know, because I've talked about language and I've talked about linguistics and then I begin to talk about this and I've just given an indication by reading this that the whole notion of the Christ that we have today within our modern cultures, for example, is problematic. But we don't question it because we don't question it because we don't know the roots of it in terms of the language and where it's coming from. It's taken for granted. We haven't questioned it. And the whole system of education, maybe from Berlin 1884, prior to now, has entrenched that position. But we're Africans to think that this Christ that we adhere to and which defines everything and which Christ is connected to the religious, economic, political system of the people that create trouble for Africans, basically. Mm -hmm. Begin to question and explore. I'm saying that our liberation would be more enhanced, let me put it that way.
how can we, in trying to break away from the thoroughly ahistorical and atemporal structure study of African cosmology, to begin to free ourselves from the problems of political, economic, religious, psychological, and spiritual, mental colonization and domination that have made us slaves to the images and gods created by others while we have discarded ours? The problem of African underdevelopment exists because, to use the words of Sheikh Anta Diop, by isolating oneself from the historical framework, one becomes exhausted in a false battle without knowing it, slicing the air with sharp swords. We have Africans and the world generally, actually, has to find a way of disseminating the right ideas within our educational system. Africa is very rich. Almost every kind of mineral is found in Africa. Chrome, vanadium, uranium, cobalt, tantalum, platinum, gold, diamonds, iron, coal, not to add recent discoveries in all. Yet Africa is poor. This paradox, first and foremost, is a paradox of spirituality. That's the point that I'm making. So I'm connecting the poverty of our religious and mythical associations with the poverty of our economic, political development, etc. Because the same people that give you the God, and the same people that give you that democracy and the politics and everything, but I'm not going to go too much into that. <laughs> Today I'm more interested in linguistics and language and too much politics <laughs> and decolonization and all that kind of stuff. That belongs to another day and another time. Okay, so. This paradox is first and foremost a paradox of spirituality. If, as Ngugi has argued, our languages were part of the colonial gloom uh, and our languages were suppressed so that we, the captives, would not have our own mirrors in which to observe ourselves and our enemies, then we have to look critically at the relationship between our languages, our literature, our culture, and identity. It is also worth noting in this respect that while we, as critics, spend a lot of time writing about the value and significance of this or that message and its specific ideological content, the value of the message as translated and transliterated into English is often also somewhat lost in, to the majority of our people, not only because of the inaccess to the other languages that the people speak and the disconnection with them, but also because we've not done enough research into our own languages and see how those languages on earth, culturally significant meanings that link with our history, our traditions, our cultures, etc., etc., etc. And in case you are getting bored, I'm about to wind up. <laughs> so, patience. Okay. I mean the fact, for example, that much global business is transacted today in European languages and particularly with notions of freedom, development, and democracy permeating several cultures of the world, especially through the various but also deeply interrelated educational curricula and systems throughout the world, but especially in Western Europe, with African nations, of course, largely mimicking the educational curricula and systems of Europe. This is problematic. It cannot be den denied that the generally accepted view that education of the leading European nations and American foster liberation. Indeed, as someone like Chino Achebe has argued, the colonial language has allowed Africans to talk with one another. However, the same languages have been, in Ngugi's words, the most important vehicle through which that colonial power fascinated and held the soul prisoner. The bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. What I'm suggesting, furthermore, in addition to Ngugi's observation here, is that this spiritual subjugation is still being perpetuated through the educational curricula. A curricula that, as a byproduct of the 1884 Berlin Division for Rule of Africa, seems to have bound Africans in a state of perpetual spiritual entrapment. And by the spiritual, one does not simply refer here to the sacred or religious the mythological, etc., but to all the elements, cultural and otherwise, that coalesce to form and reform the minds of Africans. So our very, the political, the cultural, economic, also spiritual. The work of cultural and spiritual regeneration is, unattain is attainable, especially via a focus on that interface between a close and detailed exposition of the coded messages embedded in our African languages and literatures and cultures, vis-a-vis -vis the cultural work we do with our literatures. Finish. Hey, thank you very much, Kwadja. Um, speaking as a linguist, it's super interesting for me. Like, there's so many themes in your talk that I recognise, such as multilingualism, endangerment, language and identity, just to name but through, but name but a few, but through a completely different um, lens of literature and politics. So, thank you very much. Um, we've got some time for questions. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. The books, uh, the books that you've been quoting from, were they all written originally in English? Yes, they were all written originally in English, but um, at least two of the writers, at least one of the two of the writers, talk about how what they wrote in English also came as a result of stories that they were told that they picked up from the man, the folk storytelling tradition of the Fanti community, for example, Edu talks about how the story about the story of Anoa and the story of Dilemma also came about as a result not only of the experience with African Americans later on when she went to America and traveled around the world, but also because she heard stories from her grandmother and her mother. And so those stories found their way into the narratives. But they were originally, yes, they were originally written in the 
um, European languages, uh, in, this in this specific instance, in English. So what would be the target audiences, uh, especially for the play? Would that be something that the playwright would have envisioned being performed here in the UK or in the United States? Or Actually, it's been performed in Ghana, in the UK, and also in the United States on a couple of occasions. In English. Yes, in English. Mm -hmm. University students, lecturers, you know, the wider community, etc. But again, part of the problem there is that what do people like AC Com? who's actually a character in the play. But if this is performed in English, how does she assess that knowledge and the issues that the writer is trying to discuss? It is still problematic. And we should not presume that because African literature, African Caribbean literatures, African American literatures have reached a certain level in terms of, you know, a canon of global literature, that all is well and all is right, and that the writers are discussing the issues. I'm saying that even when they're discussing the issues, perhaps much more is being left out than is being said. But we look at that and that a closer analysis of the linguistic content of these novels, which requires extra research. In fact, I have a bit much more information in relation to Things Fall Apart and the concept of Ineka and Igbo proverbs. And I found that the, 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 the concept of mother is supreme in Igbo, Ineka, uh, Neka, which means mother is supreme. I researched Ineka and found out that, oh, within the Igbo context, Ineka Neka also means authority and power and control and influence. So it exposed me when I understood why the, 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 the boys began to prefer the stories that the woman told, whereas Okonko, the central character, wants his sons to listen to stories of fighting and war and violence and bloodshed, but they prefer to listen to other stories. And I was able to con con connect that, and I was able to say, to argue, for example, in the paper that I would have presented at the conference that happened recently, that in that case, when you look at the question of gender relations within African societies, and you look at households that have men as heads, for example, that might be, to a certain degree, patriarchy does exist in Africa and globally, but also there's a certain other dynamic, other realm where women wield power in terms of the influence that they have over children, which is important. And even in a context where a man goes to the farm and brings food and he's the breadwinner of the family, if the woman does not prepare that choice, delicious meal, which requires skill and intelligence and creativity, and also the balance of life forces and needs and responsibilities, and put it on the table, the yam that you farmed is useless. And that, in that sense, if you look at power relations, if we look into our linguistics, going into NECA allowed, you know, so going into that concept of language and what it means in terms of the cultural significations allows you to have a better appreciation of the cultural dynamic. And so you can posit that as a counterpoint. So when a feminist critic in the West says, Chino Achebe is a sexist writer, all the women are subservient to their men. You deconstruct that by using language and linguistics and literature. And I'm saying that that is what we need to do more of that. Not just to interpret the themes on the surface and things fall apart, but to break down the language, to go into the Igbo, to go into the Akan, to go into the Chishona. And uh, what was that brilliant thing that um, Seraphine, um, Homala, and all of that, all those languages, to go deep inside to understand the worldview. And if you get the opportunity, come to our uh, literature and African language classes next year because we have a brilliant team that talks about the literature and in the, in the literature and African language is actually doing something related to what I'm saying here because Shenjira was able to give us an insight into Chishona culture, Alena into Swali culture, um, 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 Seraphine using Homala folk tales was able to give us an entirely totally different worldview which you won't get from reading Mongo Betty, Cameroon. You won't get it. You know, Mission to Kala or Ferdinando Yono, the commandant, you won't get that worldview in there because that worldview is talking about colonizer, colonized. But this, when he, talk, he gives us the Homala folk tale and gives us a brilliant, I should have recorded that lecture. <laughs> you, when he gives us that brilliant thing, you understand the worldview from a different perspective and because he has that linguistic facility. And I'm saying that as somebody who's a student of African literature, I need to go more into African linguistics. Lutz, yeah? You're a linguist. I need to go more into African linguistics to break down the meanings within my, my culture. So even me, as an Akan, I don't understand the full significance of this. The fact that I speak Chi doesn't mean that I don't necessarily understand everything I'm going to tell you, you know, speak Fanti. I have to delve deep and research into the language like someone like Shenjirai has been doing for years here at SOAS. That, I'm saying that that's really essential and we take it for granted. So the knowledge that we ultimately present to the world that this is the knowledge, you know, this is Shona because you've read some novel or this is Akan, you've read some Fanti writer or some other, that knowledge is incomplete. But because you don't have the skill and the dexterity, that includes myself, you, you, you think you know. You don't know because you haven't gotten to the bottom of the, the heart of the matter. And so, and also in the older universities in Timbuktu and Alexandria and etc., if you were talked about, you were described as a, as, a, as a professor of literature, you were inevitably also a professor of linguistics. Because they could, they could not presume that you could be a professor of literature without studying and knowing the language. 
And again, I'm saying that. Sorry, that's a bit of a long answer to your question. <laughs> I like to talk, as you can probably tell. Sal, couldn't tell. Yes. It's interesting. Thank you very much. But um, I'm just wondering because you never spoke so much about class. Class. Yeah, class structures. And for instance, I don't know whether you've seen some of in the West. You've seen some uh, English films and stuff. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, just put on the country. But for instance, in England, um, the manner in which the English language is constructed. It's not just about belittling the other in Africa as we have, uh -huh. but countries have been colonized, but it's also about belittling even um, their own, if you like, their own people, uh -huh. domestic affairs. Uh -huh. uh, for instance, if you look at um, in phonetics, for instance, you know, the working class language, um, whether it's in Yorkshire or in London, let's take London, for instance, Cop. Yeah. The what that in my yoga, I don't taste like what you order. Yeah, yeah cockney. Yeah. Because, yeah. because of exactly what you're saying, it's not just about criticizing the other in terms of behavior or social structure, but also um, personally, if you, if you like, or biologically, you know, looking at the other's language, style of speaking, etc., ah, ah. um, which is classically illustrated in the film. I don't know whether you've seen the film, such films like. Um, educating Rita, for instance, or my fair lady, you know, um, even 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 in those colonial, um, even in those countries uh. that supported colonialism, even within their own country, they're doing exactly the same thing. Absolutely, I mean, I agree with you. I wouldn't disagree with you, and I wouldn't contest that. And um, that's true. There's a class system within languages, even in the African context. You get it. Some people sometimes when, you know. I, at a point in time, you speak pigeon, maybe they think you are not of a certain, you know, because you have to speak Queen's English or whatever, you do re this. But that, of course, is, is contested by this whole idea of we don't have one dominant language, that we can have different varieties of English. And of course, what you're saying has to do not only with the language, but the culture that comes with it. You know, looking down on blacks and Irish and dogs or something. You know, I know all of that history and, the, you know, so all those kinds of things have to do with the, look at the, all the people in London thinking that they're they are smarter than Stephen Gerrard, the captain of Liverpool, speaking with, speak, speak, uh, speaking with a, a, a Liverpoolian accent or something. I know there are those class distinctions, etc. But my forte in this paper is actually to talk about our linguistic alienation as Africans and how it has affected us. So I do take in your point and absolutely I agree. Mm. That analogy, I was trying to transport the same idea into Africa. Let okay. We would find, let's say, like a Cambridge graduate going to, you know, for instance, Nigeria and thinking, you know, I've been to Cambridge, so I don't talk more than you guys, you know, and try, you know, transporting the ideas from, if you like, from the West into his own domestic place, thinking that he's, you know, such an intellectual. That that happens that happens that happens a lot in this um, novel too. The passage I don't know whether you were here when I read that passage where the guy goes and comes back and suddenly he can't speak Shona no more. He can't speak his language and he begins to speak English. And the English is supposed to give him a sense of superiority, even if what his own family members, his sister, etc. So that class system is actually I talk about it a bit, maybe not in exactly the same sense, but I, I do recognize you know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a um, really great presentation. It's not just about the way you talk about the normal thing. Um, it's about the relevance of the issues for academic discourse. I mean, you mentioned the word, the African world view. Mm. Um, and starting there, there is a core issue. Because the world view taken as a reality poses an ontological problem. In other words, what is it? When you ask the question, what is, that's a problem. Now, if I understood you well, mm. you are raising the issue of the epistemology of knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, my problem of what I'm trying to get to is that mm. you seem to advocate that we need a new epistemology African culture, we need to review how to define African culture. Mm. Again, I'm not going to go into African culture because that again is ontological. What is it? That's not the debate. Mm -hmm. Your debate is how do we assess 
African culture. If Africans cannot even practice the language which we tend to know, not the language says the practice, the use of language, as one of the markers, at least in terms of access, maybe production, African culture, I'm the one to talk about African knowledge because that again is contentious. But how do we go about this new epistemology? Because it's a problem that you've raised. But if we have this issue that today Africa, in the globalization sort of way mm. or trend, whichever word one would prefer, is sort of connecting to this sort of way, forcefully or willingly or unwillingly, that's the reality. Mm. How do we go about this new epistemology that you advocate? If, for example, Africans cannot be agents of African culture in the 21st century, or at least they will not be capable of using languages from what you've read in the novel to contribute to this sort of what I call, you know, collegial building of African culture, how do we then address the issue of validity of African culture today mm. for academic discourse? Because you are raising a real problem that we are not even looking at the right parts. What you call it incomplete. The incompleteness is an epistemological issue because we are not being exhaustive or we are not covering some significant area that are getting lost as we are speaking. Mm. In other words, if Africans can't speak African languages and we are still collecting information about this African to define or to build our discourse on African culture in the 21st century, there's a problem. That's what you say. Yeah. Our approach is incomplete. By being incomplete, it can actually reach a point where it is invalid. Mm. Mm -hmm. but how do we solve an epistemological issue when there is no sense of I don't know direction in that because it seems to be seems um, yeah. conundrum. I, it's a conundrum, and I think it's there's also a power dynamic in there. There's a power relation because the reason why the majority of African resources are being used and distributed worldwide to make other nations richer, etc., is because the majority of the people do not have access to those resources because the dissemination of those resources are structured within a global discourse where languages are French and Spanish, etc., etc. So when you're discussing gold shares in the gold of the Ashanti people, you're not doing that in Chi or any other Ghanaian language. It's in English. And it's an elite core who have access to the nation's resources, whereas the people who actually should benefit in terms of the majority are totally disenfranchised and don't have access to it because they, they won't even be able to, to be don't even be able to participate in the debate. So the problem, the conundrum, the problem that you, you know, you, you, you kind of, uh, you know, point into, it's also, it's still very much tied, and this is the problem that I have with Berlin, 1884-85, enslavement, and people like to say, oh, why is he still, what's wrong with him? Why is he still talking about slavery? And why is he still talking about colonialism and all those things? All well, those things are long gone. But the point is that the, this, this, uh, this the, 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 the inability for us, the majority of our people, you know, I, I'm not happy. I'm, I'm not happy to be in, in Ghana on holiday and the elite have to have a generator while the rest of the people don't because they can't even afford meals unless I can get a generator. So we don't have access to the means. And I think that's has, because the system that we've inherited are systems which have been thrust on us. Whilst it, works, it may work in America, it may work in England, it may work in other places because at least even here, you know, there might be a benefit system to take care of the poor, etc. Over there, it's in such a way that there's a middle class who are straddling the space between metropolitan capitalism and local capitalism, siphoning the profits for themselves, bringing the majority here so the Shell and the multinationals and whatever will come and take off the oil, give you royalties. You still won't be able to even refine the oil even though you've discovered oil. It has to be something. And then so the majority, when they refine it, of course, they're only give, going to give you the crumbs from the master's table. And it goes on and on. And I'm, so the, the, how do we arrive at that? We cannot arrive. We cannot begin to solve the problem unless we begin to transform the system. That's why I usually have arguments with certain colleagues that you might think, oh, it's okay, you know, our democracy, our politics. But how democratic is that democracy? How many people are benefiting? The political party might come and you might elect a new leader who claims to be better than the previous government. But how are the majority of the people in Ghana, Nigeria, Trinidad, Barbados, wherever, how do, do they get access to these resources equally? And the reason why that is not happening is that even the discussion, it's like me and you, we can only speak French. The rest of them can only speak English. And all the trade and everything is conducted in French. You and I, you and I are more likely to benefit because the people speaking English won't even have access to it. We'll only give them the crumbs after we've taken the lion's share. 
And so that was why our destiny should be connected with our languages. You understand? And some people would argue that French, English, Spanish, etc. have also become African languages because large populations of Africans speak them. Fine, I don't have a problem with that argument if they want to see them as African languages. Cool. Cultures interact and cross-fertilize and improve as a result of that. But how many people, Francophone elites, you know, uh, Espanol elites, Spanish elites, African elites, how many people, how many people actually have access to the resources? Well, that's why we have that common drum, Africa so rich, yet so poor. Because under normal circumstances, if the people had a means of determining part of the distribution of their wealth, then the poverty thing wouldn't be there. But for the people to have that means, the system under which the people are, where they have their leaders and so on and so forth, who have their masters here that they report to, that control them by remote, those guys would have to transform the system. The, 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 one of the most opposite examples is where the, the, they talked about um, democracy for Africa and Lumumba won elections in the Congo and they had expected the Africans with European interests to win and those didn't win and Lumumba won. And so Britain, France, Belgium, America, etc. were talking about um, democracy for Africa. And Lumumba said, I'm going to use the resources of the Congo to give every African child education, school, free, da, da, da. And then what did they do? This is admitted. It's not even me who's saying it. MI6, somebody died about last year. They actually put it in the Times or something. We organized the assassination of Lumumba. Belgium, France, English, uh, England, America, because Lumumba was going to use the resources of the Congo to develop the Congo. What will happen to that? After all that Le Leopold has plan pl planned and after all the cobalt and um, um, copper that you know, Belgium has stored from there, if that happens, if Congo, everybody, every child is having access to free education, da, 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 the dynamic of the world is going to change. Europe is no longer going to feed on Africa, and Europe is no longer going to be rich. Europe is no, no, long, Europe is no, no longer going to be first world. Advanced industrialized world, Africa remains third world, backward, underdeveloped, primitive, and then the media will now even show us more primitive because we have Ebola and da 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 and all of that thing. You know, Europe won't have that advantage. So, they're in the interest. So, what is militating against us is an existent European, Anglo European order. I'm not saying that all European people, or, you know, I'm not saying that, but a power block which is interested in ensuring that end. Until we begin to want to take our destiny into our own hands, but think to see we're going to get salvation from them through the ballot box. But is that a linguistic problem or an economic? The economic, it's an economic problem, but that economic problem cannot be divorced from the linguistic problem. And because the point that I was... Sure. given the question of, of, the, of economic uh, exchanges and power relationships. Sure. So I fail to mm. see mm. how the question, if everybody can spoke the same language, you can give a higher valence to God or a Khan, how would that affect that would, uh, how would that affect the question of the price of oil? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, let me, let me respond to this. So I agree with you totally, it's the economic order, right? European capitalism, the unequal relations between the West and Africa, and that dominant economic system, which ensures, for example, that Ghana has to go to the IMF again and borrow recently. So it's that world order, the Bretton Woods institution and all of that. But how I'm saying that the linguistic problem comes in partly as a result is that the people that are having the transactions, the people who are the, who are the leaders, let's say, of the various African countries, for example, right? They're dealing with the Europeans because they constitute the class and they're dealing on behalf of their people, and their people don't have a voice. What I'm saying is that if, for example, they were to discuss the destiny of Ghana and 
the Akan people, the Ga people, the Fanti people, the Hausa people, the whoever people had a say in that and really understood the dynamics of what is happening. Because a lot of them don't even understand what is happening and see the, the West as a source of liberation. I was telling that to my students earlier today that this, you, want, you got to talk about people that these people are expecting us, but they watch images on TV and they see America is it's happening. England is happening. What are you trying to tell them when you tell them that, you know, these are our oppressors or something like that? So for people to begin to articulate their wants and their needs, it doesn't even if it's English, assuming everybody had access, equal access to the educational system in English or French or Spanish, and resources were evenly distributed, we wouldn't have that problem where just a few monopolized wealth. So yes, absolutely, I agree with you totally. It has to do with the economic order. Whether or not an achaver, a person who is a bachelor, whether or not a bachelor spoke whatever language, if it was consistent with stealing the money, he was not acting for on behalf of a particular class. It doesn't matter what language he speaks. So maybe the problem is that slippers are working on whose behalf are they acting. It doesn't matter what language is speaking. Oh, okay, okay, uh, fine. I'm not trying to draw, okay, I understand. I mean, I agree with you totally, but I'm not trying to draw a one-to-one -one correlation between speaking a language and corruption, for example. That's not the point. All I'm, all the, the point that I was trying to make simply was that Africans are disempowered, disenfranchised from discussing their destinies because discussions are being run over the top of their head. So I agree with you entirely. It has nothing to do with whatever language one speaks. Perhaps the, the problem is multifaceted and we can look at it in so many different ways. But I'm saying that for a people to control their destiny, right, you have to be in control of their language and their culture and somehow that will help them be able to say the things that they want to say. So for example, this Western education thing that we have, only actually still very a minority of people that have it in the different countries. If everybody had equal access to it, then the democracy maybe, I don't know, might be truly democratic. So I agree with you. I mean, I, I'm not dis I, I accept, yes. I'm not sure whether I agree with this economic order either. Because you cannot always reduce things to economic order. Because the law, you know, uh, human beings are, are not always rational all over the world. You know, you cannot reduce everything to intellectual. It's reduced reduce everything. Economics has to do with the allocation of You know, I mean, you could say economic principles play the dominant role. You know, but you cannot reduce it to economic principles alone. Human beings are just... Okay, so, yeah, okay, yeah. You control the question, yes? Yeah, so yeah. I think so, she and Seraphine and other people, yeah. I have a question relating to the question on epistemology, because it's something I face in my own research at SOAS. Okay. And it's one of the most interesting questions, but obviously I'm not a linguist, so, so for me it's a very hard question to answer, but in what measure is, or do you believe African languages are disclosures of African epistemologies? Like in what way is this epistemological question embedded in the language? And for me that's the central question, because then how is this specific to African languages and not all languages? Like, how would this not become an issue of every language, like, disclosing a specific epistemology? Okay, I'm, I'm kind of fighting my corner. Because if you come and tell me that my gods are pagan, mm -hmm. and savage, and primitive, etc., and you're bringing me a new Christ, and you're saying all of this to me in English, and I'm able to say to you that in my, before you brought me your God, my, I had, my ancestor had a notion of God that said, if you want to speak to God, speak to the wind. Or, um, nobody teaches a child God. Or, a child, a tailless animal is taken care of by God. I'm trying to say to you that in my philosophy, in my, lang in my culture, I already have a notion of God. So the way that I'm countering that dominant narrative that you're bringing to me to say that my gods are whatever, is that I'm using my culture, my language, to say that this... I have a worldview where I also had the notion of the Supreme Being, and it didn't, it didn't necessarily come to me through the Jesu Christ, so you cannot come and tell me to abandon my African gods. Now, because I'm fighting my corner and projecting it from the African perspective, it doesn't mean that other cultures might not have it. But at this particular point in time, I'm not interested in that. So, what I'm saying is that you can, you can, tease, you can, you can talk about knowledge and the production of knowledge and the epistemic of knowledge from my perspective, using philosophy or culture, whatever, and that will counter a certain dominant imposition of a certain thought or system or political, cultural, economic system, whatever, on me. But I'm not, so is it exclusive to Africa? Maybe not, but I'm interested at this point in time in seeing how my own cultural philosophy can help liberate me. 
and make me free and not make somebody subject, subject me to something. Because after coming to tell me that, you know, I can come and tell me that the only way that I can develop is that I should always hand you my gold for you to process or my oil for you to process. And I'm saying, no, no, no. If my people actually understand that, they'll begin to question that. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that it's exclusive to Africa, but I'm, it's almost like I'm speaking from my perspective. No, but I think mm. a lot of thinkers actually do say this, and it's also extremely interesting. It's a question that comes up constantly with, like, to what level is linguistics actually very connected to this, mm -hmm. to a specific epistemology? Like, and it's a question like we face about African languages. There are specific, even all the examples you gave from the text, like tone. Mm -hmm. Is there something in tone yeah. that is specific? Like, is that is that like a carrier of knowledge? In it, a way? And it That's is, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can't get from, exactly, exactly. So, and yeah. it's or. Unfortunately, it's so not my field, so I kind of struggle. At but you're making a lot of sense, though. I mean, you're still making sense. Perfect well, sense. But then my question is, for example, if the books you read, if they had been written in the mother tongue yeah. and translated into English, uh -huh. would we have the same kind of issue? I mean, would we face the same kind of issue you see, with the translation? Every translation is a rewriting, is a re-narration. It's not exactly the same. So even when you translate, even I, I write my book and I translate it from, I write in a can and I translate it into English. The English translation might not necessarily contain everything that I can't say, even though I've done it to the best. And if he is a better translator than me, he might still lose out something. So every translation is an act of rewriting. You understand? So but you think I, that poses less of a philosophical problem, the fact that there's an original in the language, in the mother tongue. The, 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 how does that pose a philosophical problem? Because you were saying, sorry, I'm, mm. I'm wanting to think, but I found it very mm. interesting how you gave the examples of saying, like, we can tell that they're speaking another language here, even though it's all in English. Yeah. You know? So you're able to see that absence. Probably I wouldn't. Yeah. You know? As yeah. Not knowing an African language, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there's an original somewhere is that a keeper of that epistemology? A keeper. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, that the original would be there. It would not necessarily be intact because I might interpret it differently and he might interpret it differently. But we might all be drawing from the same cultural source. You understand? So we might say something and understand each other. The three of us actually here, these three, these two here, are my Ghanaian brothers and sisters. They can understand that. But the way that we will say we are interpreting this philosophical perspective to you, but you know. It's, his might be slightly different from Sarah's and mine slightly, but we might be drawing from the same base. But yes, there is some resource base that is identifiable as African in terms of the language. It's why we can communicate. It's why you can speak Italian with somebody and I won't understand unless maybe I've lived and grown in Italy or I've learned the language. I'll be missing something. So there's a core. But your interpretation might be different from Alena's interpretation. If Alena is, I'm asking you to tell me what um, the dilemma of a ghost means in Italian, and you explain it, you use Italian, but you translate it, you might use slightly different words, and Alena might use slightly different words. I might say that, oh, actually, what Alena said is very similar to what uh, Benedicta said, but still, there's a, there's a different inflection. Because Alena's own, maybe for her, she had a different experience with the ghost at a particular point in time, so she brought a little bit of that into her translation. So it's kind of, knowledge isn't that static, you know what I'm saying? It's just that this is also set a certain core. So I don't know if I've addressed the question. Toyin, you had your hand up too. Yeah, I just wanted to Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but that's what I'm, I'm worried about. When we talk about linguistics, 
and we you talk it in a sense of literature, do we sometimes forget that it's, it's, its core role in things like instruments of law is also uh, something that impacts mm. I guess what, yeah. Can I, just, can I just add that just one small point? I agree with you in, in the sense that language, of course, is very important as an access tool. However, I come from Russia, okay? Everyone speaks the same language. Everyone can understand each other. They still can't have access to the controls and to the political mechanisms because of corruption. Yeah? Because of the economical and political severe corruption throughout the construction. You can speak perfect Russian and everyone does. Everyone speaks the same language. Everyone has the same inequality. Everyone is as inequal as everyone else. Mm. <laughs> Did you want to? I'm afraid. Yeah. What I try to say is that language does not say But, but also, also, also I think, I think, I think what you, I think what you just said makes perfect sense. But also, please. Nobody be mistaken to think that I'm trying to say that once you speak a language, everything well, is okay. Of course, exactly. Well, that's that's not the point at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Issues of corruption, issues of influence always come in. But I guess part of the, the thing that I liked about the point that you made also was that, you know, there's a bit of linguistics even in the law that determines. You want to make a point? No, I just want to go back. I just want to keep with the logic of the argument. You started by talking about the Sahelian meanings of the language. Where you started, and you said that somebody who has, a, like you said, I love your example of things to a part and talking about the, the very meanings of certain words the language may have because of one's knowledge of the language. And so I thought where you started was the question of what we sometimes call the unknown of the text or the unconscious of the text, which you call the subterranean of the text. Mm -hmm. And I thought of your argument, which I think is perfectly legitimate and very valid, is that if one, if one has a deeper knowledge of the culture, and the language, one has a better understanding of the text. Mm -hmm. And I think you make a wonderful point when you talk about the question of contestation between the notion of sexism or etc. and things like things all about, mm. which I think is a logical and great argument. Mm. But to jump from there, that's where my difficulty comes. Mm -hmm. To jump from there to talk now that a better understanding and because people understand the language, etc., that is why the lack of democracy and so that is where I think of. So I was just keeping with the logic of what you were saying in the logic of the text. And I was just saying that in terms of the question of linguistics and uh, the question of language, and that that is why people are impoverished. I, I, I just find that, I, I just find that to be a okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just, sorry, I mean, Codification of mental laws in Africa are not in, in indigenous terms, they're mostly in European terms. And I understand what you're saying. It seems like a jump in the interpretation, but I'm saying that they're the same way the United Nations with this in the, the Millennium Codes. Yeah. The United Nations Millennium Codes use things like uh, functional literacy and all these kind of access to water as key indicators of ways of development. I'm saying that, I'm not saying, of course, with linguistic emergency, uh, 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 we're going to have this egalitarian world. But what I'm saying in Africa is that the lack of it clearly means the lack of what? The lack of access to political uh, uh, political power, political instruments, to ways of challenging the economic markets. I mean, Tullow Oil is the company that exploits the oil in Ghana. That's an Irish company. And so if the people who were in Ghana at the time, who were able to engage with that, those discussions at the time, had access to, to the information that was coming out there, then there would be a tendency to make perhaps soften the harsh impacts of that. I can talk about Nigeria, I can talk about how divide linguistically has caused turmoil in the nation. Let, let, let me just respond to one South Africa. I think we have a, a multilingual uh, uh, education uh, policy, even though it wasn't actually implemented in reality, but the idea that it was open to that movement towards the progress. So I, 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 can, so I, I do hear what you're saying on the sense of, and what you're saying in Russia, it's a different political discourse. No one, yeah, no, I, you're, you're right. Well, the language, language is embedded. Can, can, can I? We're, we're, you know? we're really very short of time. Just a second. Okay, go for it and then we'll let the uh, language is embedded, embedded with deceit, ostensibly. Um, many of it all spoken. You know, there's quite emotion that takes place even in real languages, which are not open to cultural observation. And you, you can't, you can't, you shouldn't think you just go around, you know, observing people and think, yeah, I thought they have something, I they're saying. People speaking silently, they're expressing themselves 
you know, in sentiments that are not open to clear observation. Which is why this, this, this your woman's answer about translation of languages and ethnic what is embedded in there, and some of it being missing in translation is so key. Because what happens is that when we do translate, but, but you know, the, 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 I mean, much as I agree that there isn't a one to one correlation between, um, you know, the linguistic and the economic, if you like, the fact is that the destiny of the people and whatever problems or whatever thing they're going through, it's a multifaceted problem. The economic one is tied to the linguistic one. I mean, if the political parties come and start speaking English and telling the people, oh, we are going to do this for you, do this for you, do this for you, do that for you. And the people vote for them, but they end up not doing it for them. And this has been going on for years and years and years. Isn't there some kind of connection with the fact that the elite who always have access to English and have access to economics and to power always remain in that position? And these people that we are going to be doing things for, that we never do things for, we're always looking up to them. They don't understand your language, but you break it down for them. You know, you have opinion leaders, whatever. There's still always something. And I'm not such, and I agree totally that it's an economic problem. You know, the world problem is an economic problem. You know, capitalism versus whatever. It's an economic problem. But even the way in which economic, the economic policies are passed down to the people, very inaccessible to a large number of people. And again, the linguistic thing comes in there. And of course, I agree with you, for example, that everybody might speak Russian. It doesn't mean there's no corruption. That one, absolutely. It's all a question of systems that are in place. All I was saying simply was that, in terms of African historical rehabilitation, in terms of our destiny, the fact that the majority of our people are also disenfranchised from access to knowledge, access to resources, etc. So for example, it's only the English-speaking people who always go to the school and who always have the chance to be the next government or the next minister or whatever. What happens to the person like Isikom and Martian guy who never have, go to school? Would they ever have access to the nation's resources? No, big no, because there's no chance. You have to go through a particular route, and that route is constrained. So yes, it's an economic problem, but that economic problem also closes the avenue for many, many people. And I'm saying that our condition is multifaceted. There's the religious problem, which I try to point out by saying that some figures that we are following, for example, doubtful, but it's a myth, but it's language that created it. Language created it, and it's then trend that myth. But linguistics goes into that myth. And even if you want to establish the connection between the economic and the languages, that the same person that comes and gives you that God or that Jesus that you look up to, that looks like him, brings you his democratic system. <laughs> so his economics is tied with his linguistics, because he's spoken to you in a language in English. And to disconstruct that, and to turn him down, <laughs> you have to get rid of his language. So the, the, there's actually even a direct connection between the language. The same people give you the white Jesus, the same people give you the democracy, the same people give you the church. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection. We have to look at it. But having said that, I do concede to what everybody has said, and I totally disagree with you. But as the Igbo people always say, wherever something stands, something else always stands. There's always different perspectives. And thank you all so much for making it a lively debate. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.